Over here I've written the definitions for the inverse trigonometric functions. Y is equal to the inverse sine of X, and I wrote a capital letter here, but it doesn't have to be. It should be a small letter. Inverse sine X, or Y equal arc sine X, means that X is equal to the sine of Y, and Y is between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. So when you see expressions like this, Y is the inverse sine of X, Y equal arc sine of X, what they mean is that X is equal to the sine of Y, and Y is between negative 90 degrees and positive 90 degrees, if you're working in degrees or between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2 if you're in radians. Likewise, we have inverse cosine x, arc cosine x. They both mean that x is equal to the cosine of y, and y is between 0 and pi. And then last, we have down here arc tangent x, or inverse tangent x, arc tangent x, means that x is equal to the tangent of y, and y is between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. So inverse sine is always in between negative 90 and positive 90. Inverse cosine always goes from 0 to 180. And inverse tangent is always, be, is always between negative 90 and positive 90. What I want to do next is go to the board and work a problem that reviews a little bit about inverse functions from algebra. We want to graph y is equal to 3 to the x and its inverse. First of all, let's graph y equal 3 to the x. I'll let x be equal to 0, then y is 3 to the 0, which is 1. So I get this point. I'll let x be equal to 1. 3 to the 1 is 3. So when x is 1, y is equal to 3. If I was to go out to x equal 2, y would be equal to 9, way up here somewhere. When I let x be equal to negative 1, 3 to the negative 1 is 1 third. When x is equal to negative 2, 3 to the negative 2 is 1 ninth. Then I'd have 1 27th, 1 over 81. I would get as close to the x-axis here as I want, but I would never touch or cross the x-axis. So this curve comes down like this and approaches the x-axis. So here is the graph of y equal 3 to the x. The graph of its inverse is the graph of x equal 3 to the y. Because to find the equation of the inverse of a function from the function itself, we simply exchange x and y in the equation. Now I could graph this by finding ordered pairs that satisfy the equation, but there's actually an easier way, and that is to, first of all, draw on the line y equal x, which I'm going to do as soon as I find my ruler here. Here's my ruler. So here's the line y is equal to x. It looks like this. Now the equation of the graph I have here, y equal 3 to the x, and the graph I want, x equal 3 to the y, will have symmetry about the line y equal x. So I'll simply graph this uh, function right here by reflecting the blue graph around the line y equal x. So I get that point, I get this point, down here I get this point, and then here and here. So this graph comes down through 1, 0 and approaches the y-axis this way. And if you look at these, I think you can see that they have symmetry about the line y equal x. Now this is just to remind you about the relationship between the equation of a function and the equation of its inverse, and the graph of a function and the graph of its inverse. I want to do the same thing now with our first trigonometric function, y equals sine x. Let's graph y equals sine x and its inverse y equal inverse sine x. So first of all, y equals the sine of x, amplitude of 1, period of 2 pi. Starts here at 0. At pi over 2, it goes up to 1. So this is 3.14, about 1.57. So I'm going to say 1 is right there. Back down to 0, down to negative 1, back up to 0. Same thing back in this direction. I'll get those points back down here and up here. So my graph should look something like this, and I've tried to do this so that one unit on the x-axis is one unit on the y-axis. Now I want to take that graph and reflect it about the line y equal x. So let's see if I can draw that in fairly accurately. Yeah, maybe that's okay, we'll see. Now if I reflect that line about the line y equal x, what I'm going to get is this graph that will look like that. Now you see the two graphs have symmetry about the line y equal x. Let me just extend this one over here a little bit so they look similar. Now this graph that I've drawn right here is the graph of y equal inverse sine x with no restrictions on it. And you can see that it's not the graph of a function because we can find vertical lines that cross this graph in more than one spot. Since we want our inverse sine um, equation right here to be the equation of a function, what we do is put this restriction on it that we showed at the beginning of this lesson. And that is negative pi over 2 
less than or equal to inverse sine x less than or equal to pi over 2. So the inverse sine of x is always between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, and so that's from right here to right here. So this in here, just this little part right here, is the graph of y equal the inverse sine function of x. Now, what I want to do next is go to the graphing calculator and see what happens when I graph y equals sine x and also y equal the inverse sine of x on the graphing calculator to see if the calculator has this restriction on it. So let's go to the calculator. Here we are with the calculator and my y functions list right here. y is sine x and then y1 is sine x, y2 is inverse sine x. Now I'm going to go to my zoom menu and let's just take this trig one right here, number 7. So I'll just press that and we'll get the graph. There's y equals sine x. And that little thing right there is y equal inverse sine x. Let's zoom in on this. I'm going to say zoom in, so number 2, at 0, 0, okay? Just get a little closer view of this. There's y equals sine x. And there is y equal inverse sine x. And you can see that y equal inverse sine x starts at negative pi over 2 and ends up at negative pi over 2. So it satisfies those restrictions that we have in both directions, negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. Uh, well, let's see. Wait a minute. Let me go to the trace menu right here. And I'm going to trace starting at the origin. Let's trace down to this last point right here. Whoops. Let's skip down to that function. Okay. Here I am on my inverse sine function. I'm going to go back until I get to the very last point x equal negative 0.981 something, y is negative uh, 1.37. If I was to zoom in on this point, I would find out that x was equal to negative 1, that's negative 1 on the x-axis, and y is restricted there to negative pi over 2. If I go to the other end of it, x is going to be positive 1, and y is going to be positive pi over 2. So as far as the domain and range go for this function, y is equal to inverse sine x, um, negative 1 is less than or equal to x, which is less than or equal to positive 1, and y is between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. So those are the restrictions that we put on this inverse sine function right here so that we get an actual function. So we don't want to let it wind around both ways, and of course, as you can see with your graph and calculator, that restriction is built in. Let's work a problem now based on this definition. For problem number 3, we want to find the inverse sine of negative 1 half. Now, just to give you a little extra information here, let's go back to degrees. Negative 90 degrees less than or equal to the inverse sine of negative 1 half less than or equal to 90 degrees. So what I'm looking for here is this. This is the angle between negative 90 and positive 90 whose sine is negative 1 half. Well, the only place that the uh, sine is negative would be in quadrant 4 between negative 90 and 90. The reference angle would be 30. I have to name the angle in quadrant 4 as being between negative 90 and positive 90. That tells me that the angle whose sine is negative 1 half that lies between negative 90 and positive 90 is negative 30 degrees. Or I could write negative pi over 6. Now, if you put your calculator into degree mode, put in negative 0.5 and press your inverse sine button, what you'll find showing is negative 30 degrees. These restrictions are already programmed into your calculator, so you'll get the correct value of inverse sine negative 1 half. Here's another problem. We want the arc cosine of negative 1 half. Now, arc cosine and inverse cosine, they mean the same thing. So that's just a little different notation instead of using the little negative 1. Now, the restrictions on inverse cosine are these, 0 less than or equal to arc cosine negative one-half less than or equal to 180 degrees. So whereas the inverse sine is restricted to negative 90 to positive 90, inverse cosine is restricted to 0 to 180. And it's the angle whose cosine is negative one-half that lies between 0 and 180. Well, it must be in quadrant 2. The reference angle is 60 degrees, and the angle in quadrant 2 that has a cosine of negative one-half must be 120 degrees. So the arc cosine of negative one-half is 120 degrees. Now if you punch in negative 0.5 into your calculator, press your inverse cosine button, what's going to come out is 120 degrees. So whereas inverse sine is defined 
between negative 90 and positive 90, inverse cosine goes between 0 and 180. Let's look at another one, of, uh, another problem that's related to these. This time we want to find the cosine of the inverse tangent of 3 fourths. Well, inverse tangent, this is an angle right here. This is the angle between negative 90 and positive 90 whose tangent is 3 fourths. So I'm going to call it an angle. Let's just say let theta be equal to the inverse tangent of 3 fourths. Now using my inverse function notation going back to the function, just so you realize here, this implies that tangent of theta is 3 fourths. Inverse tangent and tangent are inverse functions. So to go from one to the other, I just exchange theta and the 3 fourths. Well, so what I want here is cosine of theta. So I'm looking for, whoops, I'm looking for cosine of theta where theta, let's just draw a little picture here to help us out. Here's a right triangle. I'll put theta in. This is what I know about theta. Its tangent is 3 fourths. So I can label the opposite side with 3, the adjacent side with 4, and there I have a picture of an angle whose tangent is 3 fourths. It's just for reference. It's just to help us out a little bit. Now I can fill in the other side using the Pythagorean theorem. This must be 5. Now what I want is the cosine of theta. Well, the cosine of theta from this little diagram right here is going to be the ratio of the adjacent side to the hypotenuse. So cosine theta is 4 fifths. And that is the answer to this problem right here, 4 fifths. The cosine of the angle whose tangent is 3 fourths turns out to be 4 fifths. Now this is actually a problem that you've worked before, but it was worded a little differently. It might say, if the tangent of theta is 3 fourths, find the cosine of theta. We're saying the same thing here with this notation. Find the cosine of the inverse tangent of 3 fourths. Inverse tangent is an angle, and specifically, it's the angle whose tangent is 3 fourths. So that's a quick look at uh, the trigonometric functions and their inverse.